Good afternoon. I'm Heather Hendrickson. I'm the Managing Director of Harvard University's Office for Sustainability. I want to first just thank um, Roger Shamo and um, Rob Werner, who originally reached out to have Harvard uh, Sustainability talk with alumni. I also just want to acknowledge Valerie Nelson and Terry McNally are on this panel who have been engaging with us. And also, if you don't know, there is a brand new um, climate and environment shared interest group in the Alumni Association that Sanjay um, Sait and Danny Bicknell are heading up. So thanks to all of you and Philip Lovejoy's team for being here today. I just was asked, how do I come to this work? And I come to this work um, on climate and sustainable development through, really through a health lens. Um, family with asthma, um, friends living in places with uh, off the charts, um, particulate matter PM 2.5 um, in their air. And I also just think a health lens is apolitical, unifying, immediate, and tangible. People often talk about climate as goals for 2050. And I think we need to, um, you know, we, we need healthy kids and people for all today. So that's where I come from. Um, so, I, you know, Harvard and sustainability, Harvard's greatest contributions clearly are our teaching and our research. And all of the alumni like you who go out in the world and then make change for the better. Also, universities, though, um, which Larry Bacow and, and our senior leadership team espouse, have a responsibility to lead and demonstrate how you actually translate this research into practice and get it to go at scale. And that's where my team and I come in in our work. So what's Harvard doing on climate change? Um, first, our strategy and our goals are grounded in the latest science and research, both on um, physical science, but also increasingly arts, humanities, and health and other subject matter areas. Um, I think we all know the science on climate change is abundantly clear and established. And it's a systemic and collective action problem. So this is why universities and large organizations, what we do actually really matters especially in the context of the local cities, states, um, and even countries and global level policy that we work on. Um, and at its heart, I think climate change really is about equity and creating a healthier, sustainable world for all. So let me just give you a, a reason why, again, I think Harvard is relevant in this conversation from an operational perspective. Harvard size of 27 million square feet um, almost 700 buildings, and a very diffused decision-making and financial uh, model with 12 schools with their own PLs. Actually, is very analogous to multinational companies like Google um, and others that we work with, uh, as well as cities. So we're a great test bed. Secondly, um, you know, what, how do we do this work? Again, I already said it's about translating the research into practice, piloting, proving it, and scaling it, and helping others in service to society do this faster and better. We, our faculty really want us to rectify the outsized harms that have been um, basically generated from buildings, from our food systems, from investments, from climate, health, biodiversity, all these things that we do um, every day in running our, our um, university. And I think we also are trying to leverage our competitive advantage. We work very collaboratively with others in higher ed but Harvard has something unique to contribute. And let me just spend one second on that. So, you know, you noticed our climate goals are actually Harvard's new climate goals, building on our 30% absolute cut in emissions achieved in 2016, are to be fossil fuel free in 2050 and fossil fuel neutral in 2026. The reason they're fossil fuel goals and not carbon goals is our faculty felt the carbon was too restrictive. We wanted to look at the totality of the damages caused by our fossil fuel choices. And that means not just the burning, but the pre-production, the extraction, the post-production. So one of the areas that Harvard um, really wants to contribute on is what is really the social cost of carbon, for instance, if you took, take that, that holistic systemic look. Um, secondly, I would say, um, you know, our fossil fuel neutral goal um, you know, leads us to then say, one thing is we are looking right now with faculty about how, what we go out and do off campus, renewable energy, um, brand new deals and things of that nature. 
Can we zero out Harvard's health impact and even more, get the tools and resources that governments and cities could use to do this work faster and better? Those are some examples of things that we are doing on the climate, health, and equity front. The other is we're addressing not just uh, the energy system, but our food systems. We're looking at scope three emissions and addressing embodied carbon and things of that nature with 700 buildings. Um, and we're also deeply working with researchers on, on areas like health in the built environment. So not just addressing climate in a building, but what about the indoor air quality? What about the health of um, the occupants and their productivity? What about getting toxic chemicals out of the materials in those buildings? So that's a little bit of a flavor. And I think ultimately we succeed and um, the measure of any success we've had in the last 12 years of having an office for sustainability university-wide has really been derived from strong leadership at the top. Our president, our executive vice president, our school leadership, um, and then allowing us to have a very clear goals and alignment and action plans that are constantly being evaluated. Last year, Larry Bacow um, established a presidential committee on sustainability for the first time. It's co-chaired by John Holdren at the Harvard Kennedy School, Obama's science advisor for eight years, and Rebecca Henderson, a university professor based at the business school, with a brand new book out about capitalism um, in a world on fire. So these are the kind of people that are informing our strategy and helping us use our campus as a test bed. Turning to what can alumni do, I was asked to address that. I think personal choices definitely matter, but as this is a collective action problem, I think voting, getting involved in um, the political system and, and um, you know, in policy work is critically important. And especially if you can do that within your organization. Um, we see leaders like Google, Microsoft now really working on policy. I think that's been effective. And obviously here, at least here in the US, um, we have a new uh, leadership team coming into the White House. And, and I think a lot of opportunity um, with Biden saying he's gonna do a climate administration. So those are some, some ideas. On the Harvard front, I would say reach out to Sanjay and Danny. Um, we are my team um, with the Presidential Committee on Sustainability will be going through that shared interest group to get feedback from all of you. And we very much look forward to this partnership of not only working with faculty, students and staff and the city and community like we have been, um, but to also work really in a robust fashion with alumni and benefit from all of your ideas and expertise. And with that, I will turn it over to Mary Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And special thanks to Valerie Nelson and Terry McAnally. McNally. Um, we'd also like to give thanks to the sponsors of this program, members of the Harvard College class of 69, of Valerie and Terry, for example, the Harvard Alumni for Climate and the Environment, the Harvard Club of New Hampshire, and the Harvard Office for Sustainability. Additional support is provided by the Class Act, HR 73, and the Harvard Club of the North Shore. And I want to just mention, if you're uh, joining on Zoom, questions can be placed in the Q&A box. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can ask your questions in the chat box, and they'll be shared with me. Um, this climate conversations is very special, quite unusual, in fact. Um, and as you know, there were earlier uh, conversations in September and October, and there'll be future ones in December and January. Um, those have been on subjects of, of government, of protest, of economics, of biodiversity and the pandemic. Um, and this one will have a, a different flavor, shall we say, um, and focus. And just to situate this conversation that draws in, I think, both the strengths of Harvard, but also the strengths of the alum and uh, people who've been working in the field for a long, long time. So this is a new synergy, perhaps, um, that's needed uh, here at Harvard, at Yale, where I teach, uh, and so on. And I'll mention that in a few moments. But I just wanted to highlight um, Harvard and Yale's strengths, just very, very briefly, to situate this particular panel on changing minds and hearts. <clears throat> so, the science is being done at, at Harvard with the University Center for the Environment, very, very robust, as well at Yale with our School of the Environment, where I teach. The policy and law 
um, at both of our schools, with the law school, the JFK school, of course, at Harvard that's just been mentioned, and John Holdren, environmental engineering at Harvard, and the schools of public health at both Harvard and Yale have strength. Sam Myers here at Harvard and Rob Dubrow um, are working here at Yale, are working on climate and health issues, which is a truly transformative and important area of change. Um, the schools of architecture and design uh, are making these changes towards sustainability and environment clearly. The business school, uh, we have Mark Kramer here talking about new systems of uh, thinking and new mental models. The divinity schools uh, represented here by Nadia Milad Issa. And both the Harvard and Yale Divinity Schools have programs in religion and ecology, which is my own field. Um, and I want to mention in particular, environmental humanities is a lens through this, that this panel can make a very special contribution to the kind of synergy that these institutions of higher education have on environment and climate, along with the experience and concerns of alums uh, across the world. Um, the environmental humanities um, are highlighting the arts, the literature represented uh, here on this program, um, and all of the fields that we might say have culture and values and worldviews, mental models, as we've just mentioned. And that's the complement. Um, I want to just say Gus Beth, who founded uh, Natural Resources Defense Council and the World Resources Institute and headed up UN Development Program, one of our great environmental leaders. He later came to be Dean here at Yale at the School of the Environment. And he brought my husband, John Grimm and myself here because he said, we have the science, we have the policy, we have the economics and technology and so on, but we need the culture and the values, the change of minds and hearts. Um, and that is what's beginning to rise up into visibility and traction, the values and the culture and the ethics. Um, so this particular panel, I'll just say, we're gonna invite each of the panelists to say what brought them on board, just as Heather said, uh, health issues and asthma and so on. And I'll just say very briefly, um, after the 60s uh, and working in Washington during college on the civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam war movement, I went to Japan after Nixon was elected the second time with great disillusionment. And Japan and Asia changed my mindset, opened me up to different culture and values um, and religions. And seeing China and India begin to modernize and realize they would change the face of the planet, that's where I began to say, we need the values of the cultures from around the world. And that's when my husband and I began the project at Harvard at the Center for the Study of World Religion on uh, conferences over three years, 10 conferences and 10 books that came out over seven years. So Harvard was a place that really uh, held and birthed this uh, movement of values, ethics, religion, and ecology. And um, finally then, I would say what each person is going to start off with is a similar, just a couple examples of how they became involved, what sparked them for the environment and of course, of course, for climate change uh, more specifically. And I just want to add one little thing. We have hearts and minds here changing. A culture like China, one of the most influential over world history, hearts and mind are one character. The heart, the thinking and feeling dimension of the human is one. That's true in Confucianism and Taoism and across the board in East Asia. So that's what we're trying to do, unify heart and mind ideas and action, if you will. So we'd like to start um, with Virginie Green, who's a professor of French in the Department of Romance Languages and Literature at Harvard. And one of her books from Cambridge, Logical Fictions and Medieval Life, Literature and, and Philosophy uh, is a fascinating contribution along with many others. So Virginie, we'd love to welcome you to this discussion. What, what engaged you to start off with? 
Thank you, Mary Evelyn, uh, for this introduction and for your contribution and participation. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, I'm a scholar, teacher, writer, and I'm a specialist of uh, French medieval literature and Marcel Proust. So my expertise is in grails, unicorns, cup of teas. Uh, so I mean, sounds kind of uh, away from the field, whatever is the field. I work with imagination, really, and fiction. Uh, trying to think to answer your question, what led me to be involved in environmental issues, I come up with three things or three moments. The first one is where I come from. I was born and grown in uh, and grew up in northeast France in an area named uh, the Vosges area, which looks like western Massachusetts. Uh, in landscapes, it's forested hills, little valleys, and in its development, uh, it was industrialized in the 19th, 20th century with uh, textile, paper mills, small metallurgy. A lot of immigrants came there, actually. And then it was disindustrialized, and today it's a place of high unemployment and addictions. I love this area. I go back all the time. And whatever my sense of self, my, um, myself as a scholar, as an activist, my sense of what's the environment is related to my strong attachment to this place and to this uh, natural and human ecological niche. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is when I was about 19, 20 years old in France, I became, and I can't remember why, very upset and very aware of waste and consumerism. And since that, that time, I really have tried uh, to, to avoid waste and blind consumerism in my own life uh, and to be mindful of things and of places and of people. Um, so it was a personal decision, not an, a form of activism, but a form, a way of life. The third thing is more, much more recent, uh, and it's really dated from the day after the election of two, 2016. And I found myself on the Harvard Yard talking with two of my undergraduate students, and we were quite shocked by the election of uh, Donald Trump. And I was trying to comfort them and to comfort myself, and the only thing I could tell them was, we need to fight. We need to fight. So that convinced me at this moment that trying to be virtuous personally or to have, you know, a sort of certain lifestyle uh, was not enough. Uh, and that's where I started to, to engage myself much more. And particularly, I, I ended be, become involved in the divestment campaign, uh, the Harvard divestment campaign. It was a great place for me uh, because I could meet a lot of colleagues from over all over the schools of Harvard, the medical school, uh, people in the sciences, in the business. And it's op it opened a lot of things. And also to meet students uh, and alumni. So that has been a, 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 an important thing. I think I found that I could help uh, in small way, but I think no way is small at this moment. We can all do something uh, to contribute to, 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 the uh, to, to fight this enormous challenge linked to climate change and other crises. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, those comments and your work. Um, our next uh, panelist is Matthew Spellberg, who's a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows at Harvard. And he's a co-founder of the Native Cultures of the American Seminar at Harvard. Uh, please join me in welcoming Matthew. Thank you so much, Mary Evelyn. And thank you to the Alumni Association for organizing this panel. I'm really delighted and honored to be part of this event, but I want to immediately offer a disclaimer, uh, which is that I'm not really a climate change activist or theorist, especially compared with some of my very distinguished co-panelists, but I am a student of Native American languages and cultures, and in studying Indigenous cultures, I have had some occasion to think about ecology and about the different ways that human societies can relate to the biomes that surround them. And the way I came to that work on indigenous languages and cultures does have a certain ecological resonance. So I'm gonna share that with you now. I grew up in California, in also in a forest like Virginie, but in the Redwood Forest. My father had also grown up in California before me and he really taught me to love the natural world there. I spent a lot of my childhood with him backpacking in the Sierras and also in the high desert and up along the coasts. My mother on the other hand came from an immigrant family from Poland, though she was born in the United States. And I grew up in a household where both English and, and Polish were spoken and where I was able to 
immerse myself and encouraged to immerse myself from a very early age in European art and culture and history. And I loved both of these aspects of my childhood, this natural world and this cultural world, but I always sensed kind of dimly uh, a mismatch between them the sense that culture and nature were somehow profoundly separated. And I remember, for instance, reading when I was young Russian novels in which there were descriptions of forests of beech and birch. And I remember thinking, I have no idea what those trees look like. We, we didn't have them in California. And they were to me purely abstractions, cultural symbols and not real trees. And that may seem like a very small thing, but somehow it gnawed at me for many, many years, this sense of a world of story that was not connected to a world of perception and experience. Anyway, I left California to go to Harvard. I actually studied Middle French with Virginie when I was 18 years old. Uh, I graduated in the class of 2009. And then later I lived in Europe for a number of years before returning to the East Coast to start a PhD in European languages and literatures. And about a year into that PhD, I became restless for the West, I missed it. And uh, particularly I, I, I hatched this idea to travel and spend time in the Yukon and Alaska. And I worked out a plan to do some research up there related to some of the topics I've been working on. I had been studying the cultural uses of dreaming. And right before I went, I, I just walked into the library to the stacks to read up on the region. And I stumbled across a book called A Story as Sharp as a Knife by a poet named Robert Bringhurst. And it was a study of the oral literature of an indigenous people called the Haida who live in the Pacific Northwest. And that book was a revelation for me. It kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, it suddenly allowed me to see what I had been unable to see in my childhood, which is to say that it was a kind of colonial misperception to think of nature and culture as these separate entities. And, and it allowed me to see specifically that there was this superb cultural world that had evolved alongside the landscapes of the American continent for 10,000 years. And it contained this incredible reserve of knowledge about the kind of life that could be lived on those landscapes. And that was for me actually quite a difficult and painful moment because I realized only then, and I was maybe 25 years old at the time, that I was to a considerable extent a stranger on the continent where I had spent most of my life. But it was also this very exhilarating moment uh, because it opened these huge new horizons for me. After I finished reading that book, I, I said to myself, you have to change your life. You've got to start your education from the beginning. And I started traveling to the Northwest to Haida communities and also spending a lot of time with their indigenous neighbors to the North, the Clinket. I got to know people there. I started studying and collaborating with them. And I eventually started working on the Clinket language, which I still do today. I consider myself still to be something of a novice in all of this, but these Clinket and Haida teachers that I've had have really helped me start to understand something about what it means to live where I live, where, where most of us I imagine live. Uh, in the last three years, I've been back at Harvard as a fellow and I've been incredibly privileged to learn from the amazing indigenous educators and students here who have built a really remarkable community centered on HUNAP, the Harvard University Native American Program, which is an amazing, <clears throat> amazing institution. And I, I encourage all of you to check it out. Its web presence is, is very rich. Um, and I would say, just to wrap up this little uh, autobiographical sketch, that one of the most profound lessons I've learned is also one of the simplest. And that's, uh, I'll put it succinctly in the words of Elizabeth Solomon, who works at the School of Public Health and is also a member of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. She says, wherever you are in the Americas, you are in native space. And I think to contemplate that, to keep that in mind, has is an amazingly generative and powerful thing when it comes to thinking about culture, politics, and especially climate. So thank, thank you, you so much, Matthew. Uh, superb, and we wish you well in, in your work, uh, engaged field work on the ground. Um, and I just wanna mention that at the Harvard uh, School, the, the Center for the Study of World Religions, one of the 10 conferences that we did on the Western religions and Asian religions was on indigenous traditions. And there's a large uh, volume from that. It was one of the largest gathering of indigenous peoples uh, to take place from all over the world. So this is in direct line with this uh, fascinating and, and key work that Matthew's doing. And it's a transition also um, to the divinity school and uh, the work that is going on there in religion and ecology in various ways. And Nadia Milad Issa, 
uh, will be graduating from the Divinity School in 2020 uh, with all good wishes. And she's also a research associate with the Pluralism Project there that Diana X started. She spent three years in Cuba and Mexico uh, working on all kinds of projects related to the arts, spirituality, and reparations. And we want to welcome her to tell us a few of her experiences that engaged her to start off on this path. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you so much, Mary Evelyn, and thank you so much to the Harvard Alumni Association. It's really an honor to sit on this panel and to be in this conversation. Um, real quick, my pronouns are they, them, and I will be graduating in 2022, uh, hopefully, right? That's the plan. Um, I will also name three points, major turning points in terms of how I got into climate activism and how does that look now in a different modality. It really started um, back in my freshman and sophomore year at the Boston Arts Academy. I am from Boston, raised in Boston, and the Boston Arts Academy is the only visual and performing arts public high school here in Boston. I'm, uh, I graduated in 2015 as a dance major, and during my freshman year, they brought in an organization called Generation Citizens, and it's a national organization, and their whole mission is on action civics with young people. And they believe that every student has a right to learn and to effectively participate as citizens in real world democracy. And so in my small group, and most of us were dance majors, we we're kind of thinking about what our project would be because then we would carry it out and actually propose it at the Massachusetts State House in downtown Boston to um, policymakers. And so I really thought about recycling. Um, we didn't have a system in place. We didn't have a, not only the system in place, but a way to maintain recycling. There was a lot of waste that was happening. And so we honed in on recycling. And I found myself at the state house being the speaker, the designated speaker for our group. And, you know, I talked about we need a system, we need to maintain it. And there was actual follow up. So then city councilor um, Felix G. Arroyo, who was there at the Civics Day, that was the name of the event, actually followed up with me. He tweeted about it. <laughs> and um, it's the law is, in, is informally called the Nadia's Law, but he decided to take up on our proposal and implemented the single streaming recycling initiative across the Boston public school. So I was beside myself as this young artist um, knowing that I had this power to enact change, like real policy change. And so all of a sudden seeing all of the blue recycling bins across the Boston Public School, I was elated because I could see that change in real time. Um, the second moment is my engagement with Alliance for Climate Education. And they're also known as ACE. So ACE is a nonprofit and they provide educational resources on climate science and justice, as well as training for young climate leaders. So they hold these assemblies and they came to the Boston Arts Academy and I was sold. And by that time, Brian Stilwell was there and was giving the assembly and I became an, uh, a young action fellow. And there we went to conferences such as Power Shift and at Power Shift Conference, um, that's all about environmental action and, and activism. I was a part of the arts and media track. So the fact that they, they included that calls in more people like me, right? And so I was a training and leading and, and a part of that work. And then I come into my undergrad career at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I was really hungry con to continue my, my, my environmental activism to bring in poetry and dance and, and the climate justice, right, that's needed. But I found myself very disillusioned as I didn't see a system in place that really um, invited my wanting to research environmental racism and, and the ways in which, you know, climate um, issues affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And so when we talk about climate, we also have to talk about displacement of practices, indigenous and African practices. We have to talk about redlining, right? We have to talk about food deserts. We have to talk about all these things that go into um, climate issues. And so not seeing a system in place, 
I naturally gravitated towards dance, but looking at uh, Cuba, and I did a lot of field work researching Cuba, particularly in Afro-Cuban traditions. And one of them, Regla de Ochaifa, which is a spiritual religious tradition, um, is a very nature-based religion, right? Our deities um, that are called the Orichas not only reside in a single ecology, right? Such as the, the mountain tops and the river and the ocean, but they just are, right? There are these active deities. So my, my relationship to nature then became much more embodied, right? Much more, there's a way of humanizing nature in a lot of ways, right? So looking at climate issues of what's happening to us, to us humans, and that's always a focus, but also what's happening to these deities and what's happening to, to the land itself and to the practices that it might um, violate. And so that's where I find myself today is that my climate activism is, is really embedded in the work of my research in terms of um, the ways in which different ritual spaces are being harmed. Uh, for example, in Cuba, in Cuba, you know, there's the cutting down of the Seba trees and the Seba trees are really, really sacred. You would go there to carry out different ceremonies. They're part of initiation. So uh, the cutting down of those very sites then displaces, right? Um, those people that are trying to access practice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nadia. Very much appreciate your comments and your work. All the best. Uh, and our final panelist for this opening, these opening comments um, is Mark Kramer, who's at the uh, Harvard Business School and uh, also a managing director of S FSG. And his work in changing mental models, a paradigm, systems thinking, I think is very relevant to this panel. And I just wanna mention, this is part of the questions that are also coming in. How do we get people to open up about climate change, those who, who are denying and so on. And I just wanna mention this paradigm shift, which includes religions like evangelicals. And some of this you can see on the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology, and the uh, URL will go in there. And I can say something more about that, but we have scientists like Catherine Hayhoe, who's evangelical, who are working on this. Um, I think at Harvard, Naomi Oreskes, uh, with her history of science and her book, Merchants of Doubt, is uh, working tremendously hard on this as well. So there are resources um, to address this, but this mental model systems thinking uh, that Mark is gonna bring forward is something absolutely indispensable. Mark, welcome. Well, thank you, Mary Evelyn. And again, thanks to the Harvard alumni community. It's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Um, it was interesting to hear the other panelists go back to their childhood to talk about how they came to be where they are. Uh, and I guess I can do the same thing. I, I grew up, uh, my family had a charitable foundation and I was on the board of it for many years. And um, you know, every year we gave to very worthwhile projects very thoughtfully. Uh, we saw the nonprofits we supported working so hard to achieve their goals. And yet nothing really seemed to change. It was hard to say that the problems were actually going away. And I began to think about that on an even larger scale, because if you think about the United States, the nonprofit sector is gigantic, uh, more than a trillion dollars. Uh, you know, there's more than $350 billion a year in charitable contributions going in. And yet, when you look at where the United States ranks on major social and environmental and educational issues, we are often toward the very bottom of the OECD countries. And so I became very perplexed by this question of how can it be that so much money and effort is going into solving social problems so much more than other countries put into their nonprofit sector, and yet we aren't solving the problems. And I began to work with a colleague at Harvard Business School, Professor Michael Porter, on how to think about bringing more effective data-driven strategies into foundation uh, strategies and into foundation giving. And we created FSG, which is now a 160-person social impact consulting firm that works around the world with foundations. Uh, on how to achieve greater social impact. 
And along the way, we began to work with some corporate foundations and we very quickly realized that, you know, companies have more impact on social issues through their business than they do through their philanthropy. And yet the sort of prevailing thinking out there is that there is a win-lose relationship between business and society. That if businesses are making money, it somehow is at a cost to society. And if we want them to be more socially responsible, have positive impact, it's gonna cut down the profitability of the business. Well, as Professor Porter and I began to study this more and more, we realized that's wrong. The reality is that companies that have a lower environmental footprint, that are more innovative about environmental products and solutions are actually more successful and more profitable. My colleague, uh, George Seraphim at the Business School has done research showing that companies that focus in on addressing the most material issues, often the environmental issues in their business, actually generate better stock performance and higher profitability than others. And yet somehow companies didn't believe us. They weren't really accepting our argument. And so again, I began to try and think about what is it that's holding back the kind of changes that would not only make a better world, but a better economy. And that led us to begin to think about systems change. And the fact that we often think what it's gonna to take to solve a social problem is just some new innovation that nobody's ever thought of before, or just a few more dollars from charitable giving or from the government. But the reality is social problems are held in place by a system. And they are in fact the inevitable outcome of that system. And that's certainly true about the environment. But as we began to talk with companies about this idea of systems change and with foundations, we realized people often don't have a clear picture in their minds about what systems change really looks like. So if you'll indulge me for a moment to share a slide, we came up with this model of systems change and said, you know, most foundations and companies think about this top level. How do you change policy? How do you change practices? How do you create more resource flows to solve the problems we want to solve? But the reality is that unless you change the relationships and the power dynamics that are underneath those policies and practices, you won't actually be able to achieve impact. And beneath that, even more fundamental is the mental model. So if we think about climate change, obviously there are policies and practices and money going in to try and change how companies behave and their environmental impact. But the reality is if companies can spend vast amounts of money on lobbying and affect the power dynamics within Washington, they can protect their existing practices. So they don't have to change. And if underlying that is a mental model, that is rooted in this idea that a better positive impact is going to lead to lower profitability, that shifting to renewable energy, a circular economy and so on is gonna undercut your competitive position and your profitability, then the change will never happen. And so as Mary Evelyn said, we've begun to focus in on the question of how do you change the social narratives that are embedded in our mental models. And so there is a very strong social narrative in this country that if you're doing good, you can't be making money. And if you're serious about making money, you shouldn't care about doing good. In fact, there's a psych psychological study that was done interviewing a few hundred people and showing them two fictional companies. One was more profitable than the other and asking them what they thought about the social impact. And people automatically assume that the more profitable company was having a negative social impact and the less profitable one was probably doing something good. So we've come to realize that shifting the mental models is the essential piece in actually changing behavior and changing systems in a way that can lead to better outcomes and a different approach to climate change. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, that was terrific. 
And um, I think there's an interesting theme here in terms of worldviews, mental models, and a new story, if you will. And I just want to mention um, a work that I did with my husband and a, a scientist who's also indigenous from the Salish people, Brian Swim, and, and the World Religions uh, Project from Harvard. And that uh, resulted in a film called Journey of the Universe, um, which is on Amazon Prime and, and a book and so on. It's precisely to change this worldview to say we come from an evolutionary worldview uh, and a living earth community, which is what Nadia's uh, points are about the uh, tradition, the nature religions in Cuba and around the world. And of course, uh, Matthew's wonderful studies of indigenous uh, peoples and so on. Um, so this change of worldviews, there's a new term coming into being uh, called cosmopolitics. Um, and it's being used around the world for the cosmovisions of indigenous peoples to say that affects the ecological changes that are needed, uh, climate change, protection of forests, uh, and so on and so forth. So this isn't just an abstract idea, but what's been presented uh, just now by Mark has real traction. Um, and so we thank him for that. And I just also wanted to thank uh, Virginia for mentioning divestment, because of course, one of the great Harvard graduates, Bill McKibben was one who started that movement. And this is part of the practice, the action that we're all looking forward um, to those kinds of changes, I must say at both Harvard and Yale um, and, and in many other parts of the world. But that movement is now $14 trillion, the divestment movement. So it has really um, escalated. Uh, now, we have maybe time for some brief, one more round, I would suggest, because we want to get some questions here, um, because they're, they're coming in. And the, the second question, um, you've already really referred to this in your work. Uh, what changes or shifts can you report from the field or good examples? And the other one that's connected to this, what are the positive opportunities for change? So if there's another example you want to bring forward from your own work or other work, what's the positive examples for change? Um, we'll do the same order. Virginie, would you like to start? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question, but I, I talk from my perspective. So my expertise is fiction, mental attitude, if you want, but through fiction, fantasy, and, and what's important, we all use fiction and fantasy to navigate our lives. It's not just uh, storytellers who do that, or children, or particularly imaginative people. I think we all need imagination just to navigate everyday life. Um, and that's where I, I would have, uh, I would like to talk much more with all of you uh, about this question of mental and changing minds. How do we do that? How do we change our own minds to begin with? Um, so my perspective, I come from the literary perspective, which is always very anchored in singularity and particularly uh, the particular self rather than larger data and, and another thing. But I think at this moment, uh, I'm going to use it as, a, as an example of shift in mental views. Um, what's happening with the COVID-19, uh, I mean, and we are really into it, so it's hard to take distance, but there is al already something which seems to me very significant in a change of narratives and um, uh, uh, the change of uh, heroes. What is a hero? Uh, every culture has hero, defined heroes. Uh, and um, usually in our cultures, and uh, heroes are often related to epic stories. They are warriors, fighters in, in, in many traditions. But here, something has happened uh, in this past uh, year. New heroes have, ha have appeared. Uh, and they are, you know, the care providers, the male people, the delivery people, the people usually were not, it's not that kind of character you find in Hollywood sagas or epics. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that, that change also the way people look at society. Maybe it's just superficial, maybe it's not going to have so much an impact, but maybe it may uh, have a larger impact on the way people look at each other, their self-esteem, how they consider other people, their role in society. This question about what is essential work? I think it's very, very interesting. It's a big, it's not just for literary people like me, it's everybody is involved in, into thinking about that. 
Um, so that uh, that's an example where where the reflection about fiction or the way to represent uh, role models, characters, heroic situations, uh, I think are important and may may be able to change people. For instance, I think this this country has a real problem with weapons. How do we change that? I mean, uh, you know, this affection, this uh, to 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 owning dangerous weapons. I think there is there is many factors into that, but some factors have to deal with the glorification of certain type of heroes. Yeah, thank you so much. Those were terrific comments. And when you think we have a thirteen trillion dollar industry of refurbishing nuclear weapons across the country, and what that could do for transformative change in in health, the environment, uh, climate action, and so on, uh, I think that's a very very important point that you're making. Um, and there's much more I know that you intended by that comment, um, Matthew. Uh, we certainly want to draw you out. What are some of the positive uh, changes that you're seeing and in your work and beyond? I think, Mary Ellen, I'll say just two quick things and maybe a third is, there's a third on my mind that I might bring up in the Q&A if it, if it seems appropriate. But so the two things I'm gonna say for now is one that I see a growing recognition of the importance of the work of local communities in this kind of, in this, in this kind of work. Um, and especially uh, as Mary Evelyn pointed out to me the other day, local communities that have a clear sense of their connection to the cosmos, the cosmo politics that you were talking about. Uh, Harvard is a, just an amazing place and I owe to it much of what is really best in my intellectual and personal life. But at Harvard, I think sometimes we get a little caught up with our own proximity to the world stage and to global and national movers and shakers. It has been my experience that unless there are people on the ground with really deep philosophical and even spiritual convictions that they draw on to defend their way of life, then all the top-down interventions in the world just won't be enough. And I think there is a, an emerging recognition of the, of the salience of that fact in the struggle for even systemic reform of global problems like climate change. Um, I saw this very, very clearly on Haida Gwaii, the two summers I spent there. This is the archipelago where the Haida people live, where the Haida nation with 30,000 people, if that much, uh, defeated the logging companies, defeated the oil companies, negotiated an unprecedented sort of sovereignty sharing arrangement with the Canadian government over the last 30 years. And the project there has been incredibly grounded in this local but deeply spiritual sense of what it means to live in a place, to protect a place, to feel yourself connected to a place. And it doesn't have to be a place, it can be a way of life that is spread out across the world or cosmopolitan or global. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a specific place, but a, but a deep commitment in that way to a, to a particular way of life and to a particular community. And then the second thing I was gonna say is on this subject of narrative, I was thinking as uh, Mark and Virginie were talking about, there's a, an, an essay by a, a psychologist named Jerome Bruner uh, called uh, The Narrative Construction of Reality. And in this essay, he just talks about the importance of narrative in cognitive states. And he says, psychologists have tended to undervalue narrative because they have a somewhat empirical bias. And so they, they see the development of the mind is modeled on experiments and sort of pr proceeding by way of deductive reasoning. And he says, well, that's true. That does happen. But it's also the case that people think very intensely in terms of narrative. And this is something that happens very naturally in children and that we keep with us through our whole lives. And it's true, as Virginie says, for everyone, not just literary critics or writers. Um, and he, Jerome Bruner in that essay gives a whole kind of list of things that make up narrative, that make up the cognitive state of narrative. And one of the things that he singles out is a concept that he calls intentional state entailment. And by that, he just basically means that narratives have to have characters in them. And they have to have all the things we associate with characters, motivations, desires, needs, stakes, agencies, conflicts. And it it makes me think that you know when you read indigenous oral literature and you see where nature in enters into it, it always enters in the form of bears and ravens and glaciers that are going about their business interacting with people and they want things and they have needs and they're trying to get things and they're losing things. And I would say that we struggle to tell stories about nature with convincing intentional states, with convincing characters. I, I would say that our stories are either 
too sentimental and kitschy, like save the whales or nature is this giant mother whom we should love and honor. And I think we, 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 lose, we lose purchase with those kinds of stories. Or on the flip side, our stories about nature are not intentional enough, not, not, uh, not uh, character driven enough. We talk about systems which can't be understood in that way as full of the intentionality of living beings. And so I don't know if, uh, I don't know if this is, a, if I exactly see a change going on for the better on this field, but I think we have to figure out how to give appropriate and intelligent characterization to nature. And that's related to the question of how do you, how do you ask people to accept stories that are not always going to benefit them, at least in the short run? Uh, because you know, storytelling can be used to uh, justify people's actions and to make people feel better about themselves and to kind of cloak behavior in a certain amount of hypocrisy and how you get people to really take a narrative so seriously that they're willing to make a sacrifice for that narrative or the narrative inspires them to make a sacrifice. That's something we need to think a lot about. Um, and I don't see that being talked about in too many people's work, although maybe uh, the French philosopher Bruno Latour has, has started thinking about this in his, in his recent books. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. Just very, very quickly. Uh, love your point about local, love your points about, of course, indigenous peoples. The across North America, indigenous peoples are leading most of the protests uh, for pipelines and so on and so forth. Standing Rock was the largest gathering of indigenous peoples in modern times. In Cochabamba, in Bolivia in 2010, there was 30,000 people who gathered to write the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Nature. Uh, the rights of nature is emerging around the world. There is in New Zealand, the rights of the river, Wangahui, because of Maori worldviews <clears throat> has been preserved. Uh, it's been given personhood. Uh, and elsewhere, we could talk about other examples in Colombia and, and Ecuador, the rights of nature are part of the constitution and largely driven by indigenous sensibilities about nature. So uh, thank you so much, Matthew, for those uh, superb comments. Um, and uh, finally, just um, we come back to Mark uh, for whatever comments you'd like to add to this discussion, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Mark. Well, well, I'll be very brief. I mean, I, I think we do see companies uh, recognizing the opportunity to embrace shared value and to um, uh, think about how they can become more competitive by having a positive social impact. Uh, there is still, unfortunately, a tendency for companies to want to take shortcuts and for investors to pressure them intensely around the short-term returns next quarter. Uh, and the reality is companies really need to think longer term if they are going to change the internal narrative and change how they operate in ways that improve the climate. And so that shift toward longer term thinking is tremendously important to bring about and tremendously important to bring about on the part of investors uh, so that they then give companies the room and the permission to think somewhat longer term. Uh, I put in the sidebar uh, a new book by one of my colleagues at Harvard Business School, Rebecca Henderson, uh, called Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. And it is very much about how companies need to rethink their narrative in order to profit in the coming years and to enable us to change the impact we're having on the environment and she lists about four or five different uh, elements that need to change, uh, okay. one of which has to do with companies adopting a social purpose beyond just making a profit. And that in turn can lead them to become more profitable, attract better employees, so on. Uh, and uh, also to try and shift the investor mindset toward a somewhat longer term perspective, which frankly is in the interest of most asset owners who are trying to save for retirement or build wealth for the future. So uh, I'll stop there, but I do recommend that book as one approach to shifting the narrative and leading us to a new path. Okay, Nadia, I'm sure you have some good points to add here and uh, over to you, <laughs> the final word. <clears throat> well, when I think about climate activism and kind of the positive movements that I've seen, you know, climate activism for me means liberation and black liberation, because you're talking about, you know, climate issues that are disproportionately 
affecting and impact black and brown and indigenous folks, right? And so I see those two things very, very tied. And you know, organizations that do give me some hope is black owned businesses and black owned farmers and farms, right? So when you think about like Soulfile Fire Farm or Root Life, um, Free Haven Farms, you know, they give me the hope in terms of um, kind of enacting or in having these initiatives and projects uh, and to address things like food deserts, yeah. But I wanna pick up on Matthew's uh, point on characterizing uh, nature. And I think of Emily Towns, who is um, a leading scholar of womanist thought, an ethicist, a theologian. And uh, in one of her works, she talks about how in her childhood, she learned how the holy can be capricious and not always stern. And that really moved me because in Regla de Ochaifa, or what people would know as Santeria, right? The Afro-Cuban spiritual religious tradition, which is a coming together of Yoruba and Catholicism and spiritism, espiritismo. These orichas are people who once lived, passed away and then were given ache. They were given energy, they were given power, right? They became deities. And in this religion, it's also initiation based. So you go through a series of initiation until you reach full priesthood like myself. And so you enter a new ritual kinship with these deities that represent and are these natural ecologies. So you have a guardian oricha, you have a main oricha. So someone would be a child of Yemaya or a child of Chango, right? That that is your parent now. And you would have a mother and a father oricha. And these orichas, because they were real people and they lived full lives, they too have a full range of emotions and narratives. If you talk about the dances, it's a very danced religion. Every gesture, every movement is talking about a breakup that they might've gone through or uh, being backstabbed, right, by a son. And so when we think about them, it, it makes me, feel more reflected, right? And so, for example, Yemaya, who is the universal mother, Oricha, she is the ocean, right? And Yemaya has different caminos. All of the Orichas have different caminos. Caminos means roads, right? So they have different roads of themselves. For example, Yemaya, Yemaya has over seven roads, right? Seven manifestations of a Yemaya. So there's a Yemaya that's called Asesu. And it's when you are entering the ocean and you see the sea foam, that part is Yemaya Asesu. And that Yemaya, she's very calm, very forgetful, needs to take her time, talks very softly, right? And then you go further out to the water in the middle and it becomes more choppy and crashing. And that's Yemaya Mayelewo. And Yemaya Mayelewo, she is gossipy and fiery and quick, right? And so we start to see the ways in which nature have had these full lives and they too um, have a right. And I think when we think about um, the environment, it's very removed, right? And it's all about us, <laughs> thanks to modernization. But really it's that not only is this, our climate issues impacting us, but it's impacting us in relationship or being able to relate to nature. And I think, you know, bridging culture and nature, as Matthew was talking about, is very, very important. And, and this leads to, you know, what, what are the truncated narratives, as Emily Towns would say? What are the narratives that we are forced to hear? What are the single stories that are, we are hearing, right? Um, and the stories that we're, we're not used to hearing at, because it's a threat. And so in terms of <laughs> positive observation, not much. But in terms of dance, um, which is my field, there's ways in which you know you can bring in text and you can bring in, you can bring in speech. So if we if we think that data is cold, right, which sometimes it can be, why don't we bring it to the arts? Because the performing arts, dance, we know that is not respected, right? Dancers have five jobs just to keep up. Uh, unionizing is very hard. It's underfunded, but yet it's so highly consumed. 
everyone goes to the Nutcracker Ballet in Christmas, right? And everyone goes to the theater and, but the, outside of that, outside of that consumption, there's no care. Mm -hmm. And so why not access more people um, through yeah. those means or photo documentary too. Photo, I've seen the ways in which photo documentary really uh, makes you confront the people who are impacted, right? The lives that are um, having to face such detrimental effects. Yep, yep, that's fabulous. Um, very <clears throat> well-spoken and thank you so much. Uh, we do have some questions, so we wanna um, just jump over to them, but just picking up on Nadia's points, they said <clears throat> the sense of nature, um, as did others of you, Matthew, you know, the sentience of nature is emerging across the disciplines, animal behavior, whale songs, bird communication, migrations, how forests think is a, a tremendous book, the song of trees, the hidden life of trees. So the sense of sentience that Nadia and Matthew have indicated is absolutely exploding. And I think that sense of of nature's not out there, it's communicating all the time with us and so beautifully stated um, just now. So I wanted to, to signal that and what Nadia is, of course is referring to also are cosmovisions that have this traction uh, for human nature relations and so on. So that's mutually enhancing. So thank you so much for those points. Okay. Um, and uh, if I, if Matthew, I please. Yeah. In real quick, I was gonna say, um, I think, what one of the things that Nadia has just so beautifully shown us is how complex a system that genuinely thinks in this way about the world is and how there's no, there's no quick way to arrive at a tradition of such complexity. It has to develop over generations and it requires training and initiation to enter into it. And the, the I think a big challenge for talking about climate reform going forward in the 21st century is how do you get, how do you talk about the sentience of nature and these, the sense of intense responsibility in a way that doesn't just come off as silly, um, which is to say, if you're outside of that natural, if you're outside of uh, a rich, rich cultural system that has a deep and long-standing account of it, then it can just feel a little bit sentimental or a little bit kumbaya and not have that kind of weight, you know, that, that a narrative tied to the sacred and tied to a sense of traditional knowledge and uh, an initiation and so forth can have. So how do, we, how do we arrive at something like that? How do we convey that to people who are not immersed in systems like this? And uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, Mark, with your comment about the um, the 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 competing narratives about uh, doing good and making money in our society. You know, like there's an instance where if we're going to change that narrative, how do we make sure that the narrative that we get doesn't just become a narrative that people use to make a lot of money and make themselves feel better about it, or to make a lot of money and then still just act like jerks, uh, which I have seen lots of people do in the world. And so, you know, it, it's a question about what is it that gives narratives power? Um, and, you know, you might say something like the sacred, but th that might not be a, even that might not be a cap capacious enough term for what it is that allows a narrative to really have weight and charisma in in people's lives. And I think that's uh, a huge question that we have not yet, no, no one in either the social sciences or, or in the humanities has really succeeded in answering when it comes to talking about nature. Thank well, you, if I can just build on that, Matthew, for, for a second. I think uh, it's a very interesting thought. And, um, you know, part of the challenge with narrative is that the, the sort of dominant narratives in society frame how we think about issues. But it's also true that how we think about issues is what creates the dominant narratives in society. And so it is an interplay between what's internal and what's external that shapes these narratives. And that's one of the reasons, again, change can be quite difficult and take a long time. And as you say, the real insights come across over generations, not instantly. And one other book I'll recommend by another Harvard professor, Michael Sandel, uh, is called What Money Can't Buy. And, and he points out that um, unlike many times in history, we have come to a modern uh, perspective that everything has a price. 
and that everything can be evaluated in economic terms. And yet that can really distort the kind of decisions we make as people, uh, as leaders of companies. Uh, and we need to think about what are the issues, what are the choices that need to be made on moral grounds or indeed religious grounds or traditional grounds, not merely on a sort of economic formula to optimize some financial outcome. Yeah, that's super. And to you, all of your points, changing the narrative means changing the narrative of progress, which points now to materialism and money, as, as was just said. And that's the American dream. And that dream needs to be changed radically. And all of these panelists represent that. And so does the social political narrative, which holds up since the Enlightenment, individual freedom and liberty over against a common good. <laughs> the tradition I study in East Asia, Confucianism, influencing more people than any other tradition is about the common good. Um, and, and so these are, this is changing the narrative. Um, terrific uh, questions. Um, and thank you for those references. Um, so a follow-up question. Um, well, is there any other question you want to address to one another at, at this juncture? Um, there was one about data being cold and the arts, uh, but I think Nadia answered that beautifully. Any other um, questions to one another? I just want to add one thing which came from various things is uh, changing the narrative, etc. and play, uh, working on changing minds of people individually, collectively. I think it, it came from everyone's talk. It comes from involving the sense of time, the sense of living in time, personally and as societies. And that's maybe, it's difficult. It's always pretty complicated to, to take that into account in our narratives. And narratives help to build up a, a sense of time. Um, so that would be, uh, I think, Mark, you were talking about this question in investment because investment have to do with time. So, so I, I would say that's an aspect where perhaps people working in the arts and humanities could bring up from their practice a uh, sense of times that are more complex, more nuanced, a uh, sense of the past, present, future, uh, and which, I mean, it's very indirect. There are things that could be very direct, but I think we have to admit that there are moments we have to try things without really knowing what's going to be their impact. Uh, and uh, how long it's going to take. Just just the last thing, um, Matthew, I agree that there are sometimes you need a long uh, tradition can maybe built in very long time, an art form may be built in long time, but sometimes things can, can happen very fast. I cannot help thinking about Mar Martin Luther, this obscure monk in the 16th cent uh, century Germany, who I mean, it was completely unknown. And, and he, he wrote because he has problem with his own consciousness, he put up publicly the problem he had with the church of his time. And that's that it, it did not do the whole reformation, but it was a moment where a person could really act and turn and make people change their minds in, in some ways. Uh, so there are numerous moments like that where all of a sudden a certain number of things come together through action of a small group, a person, through expressions, uh, and we don't know where that can come from. So that's my hope. I, I think that uh, this kind of thing can happen. Um, yeah, I think that's great. We're going to have maybe just one quick uh, round from the rest of you for a final uh, statement. But you know what prompts that Laudato Si, Pope Francis's encyclical on care for our common home. Bill McKibben says it's the most important document of the 21st century because it brings so many of these conversations together. A critique of unlimited, unregulated market capitalism. A critique of consumerism and materialism, but saying we need a cultural revolution. That's in the encyclical. Uh, we need ecological conversion. And it's having a huge effect around the world, I can, I can tell you. So this is part of the changes I think that are happening. We could point to changes in the finance community and, and so on. But one just brief comment uh, from uh, each of you, I think, uh, Virginie, maybe that was your comment, if you don't mind. But uh, can we have one from Matthew and Nadia and Mark? One quick one. Sure. Uh, let me say, in response to Virginie's point, which I think is very important, that, that we really can nail up some complaints onto a church door and it can really 
bring the church crashing down uh, behind you. But uh, I want to say that the that the, there is a lot of work to be done to understand that boundary between the outside and the inside where narratives take shape that Mark was alluding to, that place where the inside influences the outside and the outside influences the inside. And I think we we actually have a, an impoverished account of that of that very, very hard to, very ineffable, very hard to pinpoint border. And it also has to do our inability to see that border or the work that needs to be done to understand that border between self and world where narrative gets constructed or between self and culture also has to do with the way we think about change and transformation. And that actually the, the more you think about transformation as relating to interventions in this very fluid, uh, piecemeal put together narrative structure, the easier change becomes. Actually, the more it becomes a matter of uh, a story being able to change in incremental ways all the time. And that when you start thinking that culture and the individual are monolithically separate things, then you start getting into a kind of train of thought, which I think it really characterizes uh, whatever you want to call it, European thought or Western thought in the modern period, that like the only way to change the system is to burn it down. Like there's, there's only two options, either you're trapped in the system or you, or you burn it to the ground. And I think there are, my, my sense of a lot of the world's other knowledge systems, particularly these small scale communities, indigenous communities, have a sense of the system and the individual being able to revise one another in very small ways. Someone has a, a visionary dream and brings it back to the community the next day and the ritual gets changed. I mean, little things like this, you know, so, someone has a premonition and says we got to move the village 100 miles to the north because this glacier is going to come down on us and people pick up and move the village. Uh, and so these kinds of small changes, uh, th there, there does seem to be a way to have a more flexible ability to intervene in what a Marxist would call the superstructure, you know, in this whole mm -hmm. network of ideas and systems. But we, yeah. we have a lot more work to do at Harvard and places like Harvard to figure out how to get there. Great. Wonderful comments. We just have three minutes. So Nadia and then Mark. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, burning it down. Absolutely, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Dismantling it. And yeah, because reformation is not really it. But, you know, in terms of what we could do now is that it's really hard to work towards some kind of mobilization when it's so polarized, right? This insider outsider. You hear it a lot in ethnography. This insider outsider it makes it really hard, right? With the, when the systems in place are very uh, disembodied, right? There is, in like Virginie's point, like there could be change made very fast. It's it's clear and the facts are there and people who are living the, the detriments are there. You know, we, we think about Puerto Rico and Hurricane Maria, you know, what's happening there still, Flint, right? Hurricane Katrina, like these detriments continue. And so, in terms of getting to the root means that we have to actually unpack and dismantle, meditate about, and then reconstruct after all of that about white supremacy, about racism and the ways in which all of these things are connected. I don't want folks to feel that um, environmental issues are, are, are very detached. It's very, very uh, related. And so if we break down this insider outsider after we burnt it all down, you know, I've seen it when I was a freshman at Boston Arts Academy, I proposed something <laughs> to policymaker at a state house and I got something done really fast. It's not that hard. And I think uh, that's just something that needs to be reiterated. I'll stop there. Thank you, Nadia. Terrific. Uh, Matthew. Uh, Mark, I think you wanted. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. Mark. Yeah. Uh, well, just two quick thoughts. One, I, I think it's important to understand that most of the dominant social narratives around us are wrong. They were developed to justify the world as it is. Yeah. And they are therefore not going to give room for us to change the world in a fundamental way. So I think the first thing I would say is we need to recognize how wrong many of our sort of implicit assumptions actually are and be open to rethinking them. The second thought I'd leave is something I think Mary Evelyn, you said earlier about, if I remember correctly in Chinese, that the word for heart and mind is the same word, that they're not separate. And I, I do think that this Western notion that somehow the heart and the mind are separate, 
which is in many ways very parallel to notion that the individual and nature are somehow separate, are at the core of the incorrect narratives that has guided so much of Western development in ways that need to fundamentally change if we are going to be able to remain on a livable planet and create greater equity uh, for all peoples around the world. Yeah, that's terrific. And that's exactly why we started at Harvard Center for the Study of World Religion, looking at Buddhism, interdependence, the cosmology of Confucianism, cosmos, earth, and human, Taoism, and so on. There's the, all these worldviews that do have this sense of interconnection in addition to indigenous uh, traditions. So I think we're, we're leaving the questions um, and these wonderful comments. I wish we could all applaud each of the panelists um, and especially Valerie Nelson and Terry uh, McNally for organizing this. But I think the hope here is for further synergy between the strengths of Harvard and I might say Yale so that we can synergize uh, as well, but the strengths of Harvard with the alums, with the faculty, with the students, and especially, I'm so thrilled that Nadia in particular is here because I feel this is part of an intergenerational handshake, isn't it? And the talents, the ideas, the passion, the enthusiasm of next gen that, that we see in our teaching here at Yale and at Harvard, that's what's to be released and I think this, these conversations are an extraordinary uh, vehicle for doing exactly that. So interdisciplinary uh, and intergenerational at the same time. We thank you all panelists, a big uh, hurrah for each of you. <laughs>